This video is being produced by Cornell AV Services in collaboration with the Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease, which is devoted for understanding the molecular basis of MECFS. In order to develop biomarkers for the disease and also to identify treatment strategies. Our center is supported by grants from the NIH, but also by donations from individuals. Funds from NIH are for specific projects. Funds from donors are extremely valuable so that we can try out new pilot projects. An individual donor was key to implementation and completion of the work you will shortly hear about. Our website has a donation button if you would like to support our work in the future. Cimarron Research was also supported by private donors. The following talk by Aunt Alexandra Mandarano describes some of her PhD thesis work on immune cell metabolism and MECFS. Alex has successfully defended her PhD thesis and will be leaving Cornell this week to assume a postdoctoral position at St. Jude's Children's Hospital to obtain more training in immunology. The work you will hear about has been submitted for publication, and Alex will explain to you the major findings. Because of journal rules against pre-publications, we will be releasing this video upon publication of the article in the journal. Alex? Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about my work to characterize alterations in T cell metabolism and MECFS, as well as dysregulated associations between T cell metabolism and cytokines in plasma in patients. So to first give you a little background on why we did this work, we have a lot of evidence now to suggest that the immune system is dysregulated and plays a role in MECFS. This includes things like altered cytokine profiles and reduced natural killer cell cytotoxicity in patients. But more recently, there's also been a lot of interest in metabolism in patients and evidence to suggest that metabolism may be altered in MECFS. And this includes metabolomic studies, which have shown us that many different metabolites may be differentially abundant in patients compared to healthy controls. But what I'm really interested in for my work is the intersection of these two areas of research, which is known as immune metabolism. So immune metabolism is the study of how immune cells rely on metabolism for their function. And immune cells rely on oxygen being available, on receptor signaling, on the nutrients that are available to them, and then of course on cytokine signaling to drive their metabolism. And when immune cells are activated in response to an immune challenge like an infection, they need to increase their metabolism in a specific way. They also need to cope with different environments in the body, such as inflamed tissue or a site of infection, and adjust their metabolism accordingly. And all of this metabolism is required for and plays a role in their ability to perform specific functions, such as their ability to divide, to migrate to different sites in the body, and then to perform specific effector functions like cytotoxicity or producing cytokines. Now, the two main metabolic pathways in immune cells that we're interested in studying are glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation or mitochondrial respiration. Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. It requires glucose, and it does produce ATP, but it's relatively inefficient at doing this, so it doesn't produce a lot of ATP. On the other hand, oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the mitochondria, and it's very efficient at producing a lot of ATP. So in T cells, at rest, these cells just need enough energy to stay alive. So they aren't doing a lot of synthetic metabolism, and they're just doing a low rate of metabolism. But when those cells become activated in response to an immune challenge, like you can see here, they will upregulate a number of metabolic pathways, including oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. But they become more dependent on glycolysis for ATP production, even though it's less efficient. And it's thought that this is so that things in the mitochondria that are involved in mitochondrial respiration 
can instead be used in other synthetic pathways like fatty acid synthesis because these cells need to grow and divide and they also need a lot of different substrates for other functions that they're going to perform as activated cells. Along with this, you'll see an increase in transporters on the cell surface that are going to bring in substrates for these pathways. So for example, the cell needs more glucose to drive the increase in glycolysis. Now all of these processes and this increase in metabolism after activation is critical to the function of the immune system. So when something goes wrong or metabolism is abnormal in immune cells, it can contribute to a disease state. So this is a very simplified diagram of T cell metabolism and different disease states that it could be associated with. So for example, if the T cells have higher metabolism than normal or are in a hypermetabolic state, this is associated with autoimmunity, where the T cells are more active than they should be. But on the other hand, when you have low metabolism in immune cells, or you're in a hypometabolic state, this can contribute to either cancer or a chronic infection, because the immune cells are functioning less well than they should be. So they're less active, and they may not be able to target and kill a cancer cell or an infected cell in the body. Now, in MECFS, there is a publication looking at PBMC metabolism. So Kara Thomas has this paper where she looked at metabolism in patient and control PBMCs. And she found a significant reduction in mitochondrial respiration in patient PBMCs compared to controls, but no difference in glycolysis. So this suggests that patient immune cells may be lower in metabolism. But PBMCs are a diverse group of cells. So they include dendritic cells, monocytes, and also B cells, T cells, and NK cells. And these can be present at different amounts in different people. So what we wanted to do was actually study metabolism in specific immune cells. And we were primarily interested in studying T cell metabolism in MECFS. So to do this, we collected a study population in collaboration with Cimarron Research in Incline Village. And so I went out there in October of 2017 to start collecting this population. And then they've continued to collect and send us samples. We collected blood from all of our subjects, and we saved both plasma and PBMCs from each subject. We currently have 53 patients and 45 controls in our study. You can see that the age is well matched between patients and controls. And the illness duration is fairly long for these subjects, although it did range. And you can see that one of the reasons that it's hard to get early duration patients is that it takes so long to be diagnosed after experiencing symptoms. So the average was nearly seven years in our population. We did have a fair number of males in this study, which was exciting because in the past it's been hard to have a fair amount of males in our studies. And we have about a 50-50 spread of gradual and sudden onset patients. We also asked the patients if they knew if there was a triggering event to their illness and what that was. And most of the patients said either they had a known infection or a viral-like illness at the onset of the disease. We had all subjects complete an SF36 form. And you can see that patients have a significant reduction in all measurements of the SF36 compared to healthy controls. So the patients are in blue. And then we've also included the US norms in green. And you can see those are comparable to the healthy control scores. We then had our subjects complete a specific symptom inventory survey, where they rate their symptoms from 0 to 10, where 0 indicates that they don't experience a symptom, and 10 is a very severe symptom. And patients have a significantly higher score for each symptom that we asked them about compared to healthy controls. And this includes symptoms like tender lymph nodes and recurrent sore throat that we would associate with sort of an immune response. We also asked subjects about whether they had any comorbidities or they knew of other incidences in their family of comorbidities. And these included autoimmune and inflammatory disorders. You can see that patients have a higher incidence of cancer compared to healthy controls, but this wasn't significant. But patients do have a significantly higher incidence of allergies compared to healthy controls. When we asked them about family diseases, 
we found that patients had a higher incidence of autoimmune or inflammatory diseases in their family, and this was significant for both rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes, and this could reflect a genetic predisposition to the disease. So for our study, we started with PBMCs. We isolated CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. And then we studied metabolism both at rest and after we had stimulated the cells because we wanted to see whether they were capable of responding to an immune challenge by reprogramming their, their metabolism. We did this in a few different ways. So we use a seahorse to look at rates of glycolysis and mitochondrial respiration in our cells. We use flow cytometry to look at different markers on our cells or mitochondria. And then we used confocal microscopy to actually image the mitochondria. So as I said, we're looking at CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, which are the two main subsets of T cells in the body. But they have slightly different functions. So CD4 T cells are typically referred to as T helper cells. And their job is really to help other cells respond to an immune challenge, and one of those ways is through secreting cytokines. CD8 T cells, on the other hand, are also known as cytotoxic T cells, and their job is to target and kill infected or damaged cells in the body. So for example, they would kill a cancer cell. Now normally, T cells are activated by an antigen-presenting cell, such as a dendritic cell. And that cell will present the antigen to the T cell and give it multiple signals through receptors on its surface to tell it to turn on and become activated. We can actually do this in the lab in vitro by giving those T cells multiple signals on their surface to tell them to be activated, similar to what would happen in the body. So for example, we give our cells IL-2, which is a cytokine, and antibodies to CD3 and CD28 which are proteins that are found on the surface of the cell. And this is sufficient to stimulate our cells so that they actually induce metabolism. And then we study metabolism with the seahorse machine. So this is a really nice tool that lets us measure both glycolysis and mitochondrial respiration in our cells. And the way that it works is you have your cells in each well in a little 96 well plate. And so if these are your cells here, there are probes that are inserted at different time points into each well. And those probes are capable of measuring two things. One thing that this measures is protons that are being produced from glycolysis. So this is your rate of glycolysis. But this can also measure oxygen that is being used in the mitochondria to drive mitochondrial respiration. And this gives you a rate of mitochondrial respiration. So we get both of those things, but in addition, the seahorse has these injection ports, and there are four of them for each well. And this lets us add up to four different things to our cells that can either inhibit or stimulate different parts of metabolism and give us more information. So we used two experiments in the lab to look at metabolism. The first is the mitostress test. And so here we're looking at mitochondrial respiration in our cells. So we get measurements of basal mitochondrial respiration of ATP production, proton leak, which essentially tells us how efficiently the cell is producing ATP, maximal mitochondrial respiration, spare respiratory capacity, which tells us how much room the cell has to increase mitochondrial respiration, and then we get a measurement of any oxygen consumption that's not coming from the mitochondria, and this is really just a control. So when we looked at CD4 T cells, we saw no significant differences between controls and patients at rest. And we also saw no significant differences after activation for mitochondrial respiration. And the other thing we observed was that both controls and patients could increase metabolism in response to activation. So it seems like CD4 T cells from patients do not have any defects in mitochondrial respiration compared to controls. However, in CD8 T cells, we did observe some differences. So at rest, we found a significant decrease in proton leak. And normally, you would see this as a good thing because a reduction in proton leak would indicate that the cell is more efficiently producing ATP. However, 
we don't see any significant differences in ATP production in our cells or in other measurements of mitochondrial respiration. So it doesn't seem like this is resulting in better mitochondrial metabolism for these cells. After activation, we again observed a decrease in proton leak, but it wasn't significant. And here we actually see some decrease in basal mitochondrial respiration and maximal respiration, although not significant. But we didn't see these differences at rest. And we see a significant reduction in ATP production in our cells compared to controls. So to me, this suggests overall that there may be some reductions in mitochondrial metabolism in CD8 T cells after activation. And what that may mean is that the patient CD8 T cells are less capable of increasing mitochondrial respiration in response to activation. But we wanted to look at the mitochondria in another way beyond the seahorse. So what we did was we stained our cells with two different dyes from mitochondria. So the first is mitotracker green, and it stains the mitochondria green as long as the cells are alive. And this tells you about the mitochondrial mass in your cells. The other dye that we use is mitotracker red CMX ROS. So this stains the mitochondria red, but it will only do this if the, cell, if the mitochondria have good membrane potential. And you can see this as a scale of how healthy the mitochondria are or how well they are functioning. So if they're more healthy, they should have more red dye. And when you have less healthy mitochondria, they will retain the green dye, but they will have less or no red dye. So when we looked at CD4 T cells, we see that in both controls and patients, the red and the green are of similar brightness, and they also stain the same areas of the cell. So you can see what is green is also red. We also quantified the fluorescence in our CD4 T cells with flow cytometry. So we measured how much green or red each cell had. And we did not see any significant differences in either the green or the red staining between our controls and patients. So again, CD4 T cells don't seem to have any differences in the mitochondria. In the CD8 T cells, when we looked at the controls, we see that the green and red is similar in brightness and it's staining the same areas just like in the CD4 T cells. But in the patients, we were seeing some areas where there was green here, and yet there was little or no red in those same regions in the patient cell. And the same thing was true after activation. So for example, this area here is brightly green and there's very little red. So then we quantified this again with flow cytometry and we see no significant differences in mitotracker green. So there's no difference in the mitochondrial mass between controls and patients. However, there was a significant reduction in the mitotracker red, both at rest and after the cells had been activated. So the patient CD8 T cells have less mitochondrial membrane potential compared to the healthy control cells. And this would indicate that they are potentially functioning poorly compared to controls. Next, we wanted to look at glycolysis, and we again use the seahorse to do this, but this time we use a glycolytic rate assay. And this assay gives us a measurement of basal glycolysis rates, and then of compensatory glycolysis, which is glycolysis when you turn mitochondrial respiration off. So the cell still needs to produce energy, and without mitochondrial respiration, it will increase glycolysis to compensate. And then finally, we measure any proton production that's not coming from glycolysis, again, as a control. So in CD4 T cells, we saw a significant reduction in both basal glycolysis and compensatory glycolysis at rest compared to controls. So this was an overall reduction in glycolysis. But when we activated those same cells, we do not see any significant differences in glycolysis. So it seems like activation is enough to overcome this difference, and possibly some sort of signal that's coming from activation can overcome whatever is inhibiting glycolysis. In CD8 T cells, we also saw a significant reduction in both basal and compensatory glycolysis at rest. So just like the CD4 T cells, these seem to have lower glycolysis than control cells. But interestingly, 
after activation, the CD8 T cells from patients still have lower basal glycolysis. So activation is not quite enough to overcome this difference in glycolysis. So to summarize what we found for T cell metabolism, we do not see any significant differences in CD4 T cell mitochondrial respiration or in their mitochondria. But in CD8 T cells, we see a decrease in proton leak at rest, in ATP production after the cells have been activated, and then in overall mitochondrial membrane potential. For glycolysis, we saw reduced basal and compensatory glycolysis at rest in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. But CD8 T cells also have a reduction in basal glycolysis after they have been activated. So now, I mentioned earlier that we also collected plasma from all of these samples in addition to PBMCs. And so Ludovic Gilito, a postdoc in our lab, measured the cytokines that were present in the plasma from these same subjects with a multiplex ELISA assay. And this is important because immune cells, and specifically T cells, communicate through cytokines. So T cells can produce cytokines, but they can also respond to them. And we did not find any significant differences in the abundance of plasma cytokines between controls and patients. However, we then looked at associations that existed between the abundance of plasma cytokines and T cell metabolism in our subjects. And we actually found some really interesting correlations that were unique in patients compared to controls. So in MECFS patients, we found a number of correlations between CD8 T cell metabolism and plasma cytokines. We found significant negative correlations between IL-2, IL-12, TNF-alpha, and IL-8, and CD8 T cell glycolysis. So patients are in the blue, and controls are in the red. And all of these correlations were only significant in the patients and not in the controls. And what's interesting about them is that each of these cytokines would actually be expected to stimulate T cells and stimulate their metabolism, but they have the opposite effect in our patient cells. And what's really interesting to me is that, for example, in TNF-alpha, the trend is actually positive in the controls, and the same thing is true for IL-8. So it's almost the opposite association that we're seeing in the patients. We also observed a significant negative correlation between IL-10 and CD8 T cell glycolysis in the patient cells. And IL-10 typically functions as an immunosuppressive cytokine, so it's actually inhibiting the immune response. Typically during a chronic viral infection, you'll find this. And its job is to shut things down, so you would expect that it would associate with lower metabolism, and it does. But this correlation is not present in the healthy control subjects. We did also find some correlations that were specific to controls and not patients. And a couple of these included IL-17 positively correlating with basal and maximal respiration in activated CD4 T cells. So this cytokine is expected to stimulate T cells, and it makes sense that in CD4 T cells it would stimulate their metabolism. So this association does make sense but it isn't present in the controls. And in fact, we see a negative trend in the controls for basal respiration. So again, we're seeing these opposite associations to what we would expect in MECFS patients. And this suggests an overall dysregulation in cytokine and metabolism connections in patients. So to take this back to the big picture, if we look at our spectrum of different metabolic states and disease states, Everything that we and others are seeing in cells is suggestive of hypometabolism in MECFS cells. And this would be consistent with some kind of ongoing chronic infection, as would these dysregulations we're seeing in our cytokine associations. But we obviously have a lot more work to do to determine if this is the case. And with that, there are a couple of major remaining questions from this work. So first of all, we don't know what is causing metabolism to be lower in MECFS T cells, and that's something that we're interested in figuring out. And then we do want to know, how does this alteration in T cell metabolism actually affect the cell's function? And so that's going to be an important question moving forward. 
So with that, I would like to thank everybody in my lab, especially Jessica Maya, who did a lot of this work with me over the last year, and Ludo, who did the plasma cytokine analysis for these subjects. We've had a ton of help from Cimarron Research in getting this study population and all the samples to do this. Early on, we didn't have the seahorse machine that we needed to do this project, and the Geyer Lab at Dartmouth was really kind in having us come up and helping us run these assays. We've had a really generous private donor without whom this project would not have been possible. And we've also had a lot of help from the Cornell Imaging Facility for all of our experiments and funding from NIH. Thank you.